concentrate on as we fall in line under the true servant of God to follow and do God's uh, will. I, I want to open this when from Acts chapter 4 where um, they had just, uh, the uh, apostles had just healed a 40-year-old man that was born lame, paralyzed from the womb to 40 years old. And everyone did agree that it was quite, a, quite an accomplishment. It was a miracle. And they gave credit to that. That gave credentials. We have about, this is the beginning of the church. We've got, gone from 120 up to 5,000 at this time as that word continues on. Now, as it was in the beginning of the church, so it will be at the end. And much of the word that God gave us applies to this generation. So having said that, let's pick it up if we may with verse 7, Acts chapter 4. After that accomplishment, you know, what did they do to um, Peter and the others? They arrested them. Put them in jail. Okay. But now they're going to give them a hearing the next morning. Acts chapter 4, verse 7, we pick it up at that time. And when they had set them in the midst, this is of your chief priest and his, uh, his cohorts, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, this is very important because I don't care what you do, it had better be in the name that the power is in. Or you're, wa you're spinning your wheels. You're wasting your time. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. These were not appointed by God and they weren't elected by Israel. They were all appointed by a Roman general and uh, certainly had no business being even called rulers, much less uh, that they were. Verse 9, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole. How did it happen? He's, he was 40 years old. He's paralyzed from birth, right from the womb. What, what are you going to say about it? Okay. Verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. You got a bunch of Sadducees that didn't believe in life after death in this group. Naturally, that's going to tickle the strings of their little old heart if they've got one. Okay. And unfortunately, many government officials, that's what happens here, is they pull away from the Word of God. They pull away from serving God and begin to serve themselves. And that's kind of what Peter's saying here, okay? And uh, verse 11, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. In other words, naught means you considered him worthless. And now he's in power. And this is the power that accomplished this, and you're going to answer for it. Verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none under name, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In other words, there isn't. Yahshua is Yahweh's Savior. He only sent one. You missed that one, you missed the boat. Period. End of story. Okay. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They were also good scholars of the manuscripts. Not necessarily in the law of critique that these people practice, which is not according to God's law or any other law other than what this man says or what that man says. 
never checking with what God says, and God's law has always been supreme. Anytime you want to guess, does, does God's law still exist? Check out the law of gravity. You know, pull both of your feet up and see what happens. Okay. You'll find out God's law of gravity is still very much in, in uh, action. Okay, 14. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. I mean, how are you going to argue with that? Forty years old. They all knew him. And here he's walking and jumping and skipping about, praising God. How can you answer that? They, could, they sure couldn't do it, nor can they to this day. But Christ still can, always has, and always will. Verse 15, But when they had uh, commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. They did this secretly. Okay, now Just move them on out and let's plan something here. Anything will do, usually, okay, when you get a, a group of fruitcakes together like this, okay, to come up with a new plan that maybe the people will buy this one. Ain't no way, okay. People are too intelligent to be hogswoggled. That's an old southern term, okay. And um, it just isn't going to fly, okay. 16, saying, what shall we do to these men? For they indeed, for for that indeed, a notable miracle hath been done by them, is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. They've seen it. They have observed it. It happened. And what what can we say? You know, this will still be today. You might say, well, what are they going to do about this? Well, watch. There's nothing new under the sun. Seventeen. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Do you know something? They're trying it even to this day. Take God's name out of the Constitution. Take God's name out of the Pledge of Allegiance. Take God's name out of the schools. You know. Take God's name away from Christians and bring in atheistic communism that certainly is against Christianity. Always has been. And many of us have lost many good friends fighting communism and socialism. We do not consider it to be a nice, pleasant task. And to see it come home to roost is not a pleasant thing. But here they're always trying that. Pull them away from God. Deny God. Double speak. Put it right in their face. 18. And they called them and commended them, commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. That would be the day. Okay. That has never happened and it will never happen. And the power behind that name still exists. And when you are wiser than the serpent and you operate within the bounds of the law, there's no one can prevent you from teaching in that name. And so it is and so it shall always be. 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Do you think for one minute that we're going to listen to you instead of God? Now, that comes down to you today. Okay. Are you going to listen to man? Are you going to listen to man's dreams? Or are you going to listen to your Father's Word that He sent to you? There's nothing new under the sun. What they tried then, they will try again over and over and over. But you are far too intelligent to be taken in by such nonsense. Okay. Our Father loves His children. So He said, hey, you just judge for yourself. Do you think we're going to listen to you or we're going to listen to God? Verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. 
In other words, we're going to stick to facts. Like it or lump it. There you got it. 21. So when they had further threatened them, I'll always rough them up a little bit, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done, that great miracle that happened okay, before their very eyes. You know, Christ has that power. It's dunamis in the Greek, dynamite. Absolute. And none of that power has slipped away. If anything, as we grow closer to the end, it amplifies. And people hunger for truth. And so it is. What do you do when people hunger for truth? You feed them. Okay. You feed them what? The Word of God. Not the traditions of men that make void the Word of God. 22. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. I mean paralyzed from the mother's womb. And here he's jumping with joy. 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is, verse 25, who by the mouth of thy servant David, here's our key word, servant of God, and here the servant, uh, your servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against um, his Christ. Do you think that shook God up? Because the rulers of the world wanted to take God's name out of, um, out of the, the, the word of God. You know, I, I want, I'm, do you know what he's quoting here? Is Psalms 2. Okay. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Who are the heathen? Anti-God people. Okay. Anti-Christian people. But be, be kind and say those against God. They're heathen. Okay. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed sayings. So don't, don't be surprised by what you hear. Okay. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He's got them going in circles, chasing their tails like a dog. Okay. They don't know from here or come here or sick them. Okay. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. That day is coming. We're nearing the end. We're very, very close. No one knows the exact time, nor are we supposed to. But we're in that generation, uh, certainly the generation of the fig tree. And so it is. But that's what he's quoting here. But most of all, he has another real deep truth, a new song you're supposed to know. And um, it comes from the mouth of that servant. Uh, verse 27, returning again to chapter 4 of the book of Acts. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, uh, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. And do you know something? Do you know what this word child, do you know what the word servant is as it was used? It's pay us. Do you know what this word child is? Pay us. In other words, translate the word child, servant of God. Okay. Not only a child of God, but the servant of God. Therefore, you know who the true servant of God is. It's Christ himself. Okay. And you're supposed to be a fellow servant. Verse 28. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determine before to be done. It's going to. Have you read it? Do you understand it? It's going to happen exactly as God said it would. What you have to do is absorb it 
as a servant of the living God. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that you, that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And there that word child, Pais, is again, servant of God. As he has done, you, you have that same power. You plug into it. How precious our Father is, and remember, there's nothing new under the sun. And as it was in the beginning, so it shall be at the end. One more verse. 31. And when they had prayed and placed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Don't, don't ever be afraid to speak boldly when you use the gray matter up here, okay? When, be wiser than the serpent. Don't play games with the serpent, or guess what? He'll bite you. Real good. But straightforward, getting behind you in the name of Jesus. And as it was written, God is in control. Not people of the world. Our Heavenly Father is. He's still on the throne. Now, where else was he quoting from that is ever, ever, ever so very important? He was quoting Isaiah 42. Okay. We're going to go there right at this time. Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect. Do you know who God's elect are? You should, along with him. In whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles, that is to say, to the nations properly translated. Now listen to me, we're, we're in Hebrew here, and naturally payas doesn't cut it because that's Greek on servant and child. But here, what is it in the Hebrew? It's ebad. Ebad means to work, and it comes from the prime root of abad. It means to get out there and work, okay, to work at it. But I just want to be a Christian. I never want to do anything but just be a Christian. You're not going to make it. Okay. You're just not going to cut it. You have to work at it. Well, how do, what do you mean? Work. Study this word to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of God so you know what to do. Otherwise, you're a lost soul. You have no, only God knows the future. And you've got to take it from him. What are his intentions? Verse 2. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Not going to be a lot of rabble rousing. He's a man of action. He speaks, and it happens. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quince. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. The main thing you want to do, beloved, is stay in truth. And that truth will set you free. Do you know, do you know what this is saying here? Is, you know, a broken reed, once it breaks over, man, you, it'll fall apart just if you almost look at it crooked. Well, he can straighten it without ever breaking it. And, and <clears throat> do you know what? Uh, uh, smoking flax, that's a wick in a lamp. And when it starts smoking, it doesn't put out much light. Okay. And a lot of you have light bulbs now, and you, you know, you're kind of spoiled. Some of us grew up where all we had was wicks. Okay. And you had to keep those wicks trimmed if you wanted to study properly and have enough light to read by. What it's saying, he can trim that wick without ever putting it out. The flame. 
And do you know what happens when you trim it? It's much brighter. It gives off a lot more light. And he can do that in your life. He can touch you and give you that light through the Holy Spirit without upsetting your life one iota as long as you obey. Verse 4, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isle shall wait for his law, not man's. Man can try to make all the laws he wants to, forget it. And we're going to have God's law. Okay. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and the Spirit to them that walk therein. Has he given you that Spirit? It's his, it's Holy Spirit, plus your own Spirit, huraka, which is to say your intellect, your soul. Your father did all this. You, you come in good lineage. It's the children of Almighty God. Don't let man rob you of that, whatever you do. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles. And that's what Christ is. He is that light. Man, he burns brighter all the time when people listen. To open the blind eyes and to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. That, that is to say, those that have been lied to, misled, and are in deception. He gives you truth and leadership whereby you can stand up like a son or a daughter of the living God and act like it. Uh, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. No, there's only one Father. He's yours. Okay. He's not going to share it. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and the new things do I declare. This is what you want to sharpen up. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what the Word said? New things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. You want to be sure you know what they are. He's promised that. And I assure you, he keeps his promises. And as long as you study this word, in the season that truth is supposed to bring forth, it will spring. It is his promise, and he always, always keeps his promises. And we're ready for that new time, that new period. You've learned by the farmer. But the new is coming. Verse 10. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Do you know what it is? And his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. That's the whole world. You want to know it and you want to absorb it. New song. And we're going to be talking in the next 30 days quite a bit about that new song. So you might lock that away and, and um, wait upon the Lord. Verse 11. Like the wilderness and the cities thereof, lift up their voice. The village that Kedar, that's Africa, doth inhabit. Let the inhabitants of the rock, that is Selah, sing. Let them uh, shout from the top of the mountains. And got something, the whole world, something to shout about. Father's taken over. Okay. Verse 12. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. Don't try to take God's way out of your name, out of your vocabulary. Don't allow anyone to do that to you. That would be the biggest heist in the world is for Christians all over this world to allow some idiot to take God's name away from us. It's not going to happen. Well, you're calling names. Well, that's what they are, you know. And you might, many might say, well, you mean you're calling people that don't love God a fool? Well, it says anybody that doesn't love fa Father is a fool, and they have a special day. It's April the 1st, okay. 
verse 13. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. You can believe that. You can put it in the bank. It's going to happen, and we're coming to that door. Do you know that new song? 14. I have long time holding my peace. Been waiting for this. I have been still and refrain myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman and I will destroy and devour at once. Do you know what that means? What do you when a woman travails? That's labor pains. The birth of a new age. It's coming. And guess who's the head sto uh, cornerstone? Christ himself, the servant, the true servant of the living God. It is his promise. It is his song. It's the song of the Lamb. And he cries it and he sings it. Have you learned it? Are you familiar with it? Go with me now to 43. It's just the next one after 42, would you believe? And we're going to pick it up in verse 10. Same thought. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant. There's the word again, okay. My servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I am that I am. Ea asha ea in the Hebrew tongue, okay? He's it. Verse 11. I, even I, two times for emphasis, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. You know, people, I hope, will absorb that. We don't want anyone to see. We don't want anyone to go astray. That's why we dedicate our lives to teaching the Word of God. It's so that all hear and salvation comes to the doorpost. I have declared, in verse 12, I have declared and have saved, and I, would, I have showed. When there was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witness, saith the Lord, that I am God. But you know, there's a strange God coming. Unfortunately, well, how, how do you know that? Well, it's written in God's Word. He warns us. He promises that the false one will come. And he's going to come before Christ himself returns. But what do you have to worry about? Because you've got power over him. No step for a stepper. Okay. You can cut it. Why? Because the man on the throne is behind you, in front of you, and around you. Yea, before the day was I was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work. And who shall let it? Who, who's going to try to turn it back? Uh, it's not advisable to try to turn back uh, our Heavenly Father. Thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon, that's confusion, and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in their ships. They're, they're, not going to, they're not going to make it. The world is going to come around. Every knee is going to bow before Almighty God. Every tongue shall confess how precious it is that our Father in control and... Um, and so it is. Verse 15 to continue. I am the Lord, your Holy One, and Creator of Israel, your King. King of kings and Lord of lords. You have the triune Godhead right there in that one verse, okay? Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters. I always open it up for you. Do you believe that? Have you ever had a real difficult chore that you just really dreaded and you prayed about it and he just opened the way for you? I've had that happen to me many times in my life. He knows how to get it done. And he gets it done. When he promises it, you remind him of it, he'll keep his word. Okay. Verse 17, Which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power, 
They shall lie down together, they shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. I'm going to put their light out. In other words, there's not going to be any evil after that first day of the millennium. Verse 18, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. You see, this is where it comes in. Well, why did he tell us all those old things? Because there's nothing new under the sun. That that has been is going to be again. So all you have to do is watch it, and a child can figure it out. Because as it happened then, so it will happen. Well, just exactly what do you mean like that? Like the chariots, of, and they are not. Well, what happened when he parted the Red Sea? And, and Moses led Israel across, okay? What happened right after that? God closed it right over Pharaoh's uh, chariots. He drowned them all. He put out their light. Well, well, that's past history. He's still on the throne. The new song is coming forth. And you want to get ready for it. Okay. The, God is the same yesterday. He is today. And he will be forever. He's king of kings. He is lord of lords. He is all in one. Verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Are you ready for it? I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Question. I don't know. Have you read it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I'm, I'm going to show you how to get it done. It's a new song, a new way, and we're going to talk about it in the next few months, weeks. Verse 20, The beast of the field shall honor me the dragons and the owls because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. God always takes care of his chosen. Okay, That's God's elect. That's his, that's his servants right here on earth. His servants that follow him. One more verse, 21. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. They're always going to teach my word, as it is written, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And they're going to bring my word forth to the world whereby it is heard. For the new day approaches. And Father is still on the throne. And we can praise him for that. Because he still has all power. You know... He only let Satan play around while well, he's letting him come to the earth. So big deal. Okay. That, that's play stuff for us. As it's written in Luke, he, gave us, he gives us power over all of our enemies. We're in a new day. Where have you been? Demand, remind God of the promises he's made. Claim them and enjoy them. For we're coming into that gate. That gate of new beginnings, the travail, the birth of a new age. You can feel it all around you in this world today, where she's heading, where it's geared up. You want to be ready to serve him. Father is the same yesterday, he is today, and he shall be forever. And blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm, I'm going to complete this by going to Philippians the great book of Philippians in the New Testament. Let's pick it up in chapter 2. New Testament here. Nothing new under the sun, old or new. It's still God's Word. And many times there's more in the Old Testament, so-called, about what tomorrow brings than is written in the New so you have to absorb all of God's word. I'm, I'm just going to start with verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, if any compassion, okay, you listen to it. Okay. Fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, you know, it's get along when you're serving God. Well, I just have this little thing where I'm different than other people. Well, you're an oddball, aren't you? Okay. You don't want to be that. Okay. 
God sometimes gives us special uh, duties. That's fine. But don't be an oddball. Okay. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. For you know something? You know yourself and you know there are people better than you. But you know something? That same person is going to think the same thing about themselves if they're a true Christian. Because we're not perfect. Regardless of how good you are, we still fall short sometimes. But that's okay. On repentance, God still loves you. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Be happy for others. Be interested in helping them get ahead. Let this mind or attitude be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who bring in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Emmanuel, God with us. So he was named. God said, call him that. Way back in the book of Isaiah in chapter 7, he said, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child and you shall name him Emmanuel, being interpreted is God with us, uh, with you. Okay. And so it was that he, the living word, became flesh and walked among us. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Okay. You got it? Underline it. Okay. A servant and was made in the likeness of men, just like any other. He didn't, he didn't put himself up as king of kings and lord of lords in the first advent. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. A criminal's death he suffered. Do you hear what it said? A criminal's death he suffered. Found guilty though he was innocent. But it was for you, okay, beloved. He opened not his mouth, just as the prayer we led, a, a scripture we read earlier stated. He, he doesn't whimper. He doesn't whine. He gets it done. Always has. He always will. Verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth. That's the first day of the millennium. It's coming, beloved. They're not going to have any choice at that time other than to recognize the power of the Creator. For it will be very obvious because of events that will transpire in the not too distant future. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Naturally, we know then we're in the millennium. It's coming. Are you a servant of God? Uh, let me ask that a little different way. To be a servant, it means work. Do you know how to work for God or do you just uh, read and play? Okay. Think about it. Do you ever talk to him? That's what he wants you to do. I mean, he's, he, he created you for his pleasure. He made you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. He wants to hear from you. He wants you to tell him you love him. That's what he wants most. If you don't, so be it. But don't try to lie to him. Okay. But boy, for what he's done for you, you want to confess. Okay. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. To will and to do. You know, a lot of people have the will, but they don't have much do. And, and God takes note of that. Uh, and you might say, well, are you saying we're supposed to all be preachers? No, I didn't say that, nor did he. Okay. But with your own family in setting the way, living that Christian life, giving counsel, 
Sooner or later, some one of your friends is going to say, I, I'm, I've got a problem. I need some help. Are, are you going to be able to help them? Are you going to be able to advise them from not your word, but the word of God? Are you going to be able to show them? Because it's important, beloved. That's serving him. If you ever only help one person in your life, and all of you have, I know you, you have. You've strengthened. You've given them hope in Him. And that's what it takes. And that's what our Father expects from us. So, Ebed servant. Christ Himself was the head servant. He never made Himself anything else. That's what God called Him. And that's why He came here to show us how to do it. If you ever wonder, well, really, what is the bottom line? Why did Christ come to this earth in the flesh? Then you want to make a note of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Christ came to the earth. He died on the cross to destroy death, which is to say the devil. Okay. That's what it's all about. We won't have him around anymore at the end of the millennium. But until then, you want to remember Ebed, work for a father, a, ser a, a servant. Even as Christ was a servant, showing us how and showing us the way to be an encouragement to others, a light in a dark world. I mean, the, 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 the darkness is so thick anymore that you can feel it. But a word of counsel brightens like a searchlight in a storm. Be ready. Be prepared. Prepare yourself with a sword. And that's the two-edged sword, as you would read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, which is the tongue of Christ, which is truth. It cuts both ways. You know, a person that is armed with the word of God can take a, a person and simply slice them up. And it helps. It heals. It helps them. It's the sword of truth. Always p possess it. Have that sword of truth, which is the word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the privilege again of serving you, Father. Bless each and every one of these, Father. Let them be a blessing to those they come in contact with. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Here to establish his kingdom on this earth. He doesn't want his children flitting around out in space. That's stupid. And um, so uh, that, that's one of the places that it really irks me. You will find another place which is very damaging concerning Lucifer, son of the morning, in Isaiah chapter 14. Read it and find it in your old King James and then see what they've done with it. It's like they were trying to hide Satan's work whereby a new reader wouldn't know what it was. You can see how the little Kenites, like in newer translations, like to work overtime. It takes, it doesn't take that much of a scholar to spot it, okay? Uh, Elva from uh, Arizona. Did I hear you right say there was going to be no flesh in the new s system? after the millennium or was I wrong no you heard it We're, we've got a much better body why would we want to go back into these old painful flesh bodies you have you have a body that is it doesn't age it doesn't get old it doesn't get sick doesn't get tired 
And as far as that's concerned, it can walk through fire without being burned. Okay. So it's in a different dimension than we are. And uh, so why would we want to go back to these things? Again, especially in Genesis 6, 3, where it grieved God that he had put man in flesh. Sandra from Colorado. A question. Explain the Kenites as a race. I think of races as being defined by the color of one's skin. Well, that's, that's, that is not uh, always correct because uh, Adam, the word Adam in the Hebrew tongue means ruddy complected. Okay. Um, Adam, Eve have been taken from the helix curve of Adam, meaning the DNA, the feminine DNA from Adam, meaning she also was ready complected. Therefore, naturally, the uh, uh, Kenites would be in part that complexion, but not necessarily ready. Okay, uh, I won't go any deeper into it than that because um, uh, we're not to bother the tares; we're to leave them alone. Tim from Louisiana. Pastor Murray, are God's seven deadly sins listed all together in one spot in the Bible? Or all they are they scattered throughout the Bible? No, they're the things that the six things that God hates and the seventh of an abomination, they're they're listed in Proverbs. It's real easy to remember. Six sixteen. Proverbs six sixteen. But but don't read over the fact that when you commit them all, he considers seven an abomination. He hates it. Okay. Um, La Lucretia from South Carolina. Who are the peculiar people Pastor Murray speaks about in the book of First Peter? Well, it's, it's not I that speak about them. They're in First Peter. They're spoken of by uh, Peter himself from the Father. They're God's elect. They're peculiar in the sense that there is no way Satan can deceive them. <clears throat> there is no way that Satan can uh, trick them or fool them. Well, they know who he is. They know that he returns first. They know that he's going to have a little message, I've come to fly you out of here. And he looks just like Christ and claims to be Christ. And the whole world whores after him. That is real sad. That gives me no pleasure. And the peculiar people will make that stand and witness against him. That is a destiny and a, and a, and a purpose that is outstanding in God's word. You can read of it in Matthew 24 that the young man asked about earlier. You can read about it in Mark chapter 13 or in Luke chapter 21 of what it is you're to do at that time. Troy from Wisconsin. In the second epistle of John 13, who are the elect sister uh, greet thee? Now, well, the, the elect sister is, is God's elect, okay, that were scattered abroad. There has always been people that know the truth, know the manuscripts, deal in the manuscripts. God give, gifts them to be able to handle the manuscripts so that even with backing of the Masara, which is the original footnotes to the Hebrew manuscripts, that a man cannot change that. And it doesn't matter how many translations that someone might tamper with. A good scholar knows from the Masara what the originals say. So they can't fool us. And naturally, if you are a teacher, you're going to call that to everyone's attention every time you get a chance without making it boring. Okay? So, uh, and so it is. Masara simply means in the original footnotes, to pass a thought from one's mind to another without it being changed one little smidge. Exact. And so it is. <clears throat> Sarah from Georgia. How does one honor one's parents? Please elaborate. I have a strained relationship with both my parents. 
I love each. They are divorced, but I must keep them at arm's length. <clears throat> love them and appreciate them, excuse me, because they brought my sister Sarah into the world. Okay. The two of them did. And thank God she's here. And, and thank God it was they that brought you here. And so you can honor them for that, and you will have long life. As it is written, that's one of the first promises of long life, is to honor your parents. You can read it in Exodus chapter 20. Okay. But um, just, um, you know, when we are, as Christians, we're adults. And sometimes you can have people even older than you are that are still children in the world because they, they don't understand God's Word. And so they act like children. Uh, they don't know any better. So we can be a little forgiving and understanding in that sense. Okay? So you can honor them because, Sarah, you're here. Billy from North Carolina. What is the difference between judging and discerning? Judging is a sin. It is to judge someone to hell when you have no authority whatsoever to judge someone to hell. Okay. Uh, only God has that authority. Now, discerning, though, that same person, you discern enough that you don't want to make the trip with him, so you avoid that person. You, you, until they have a change of heart and a repentance, you avoid that person. That's spiritual discernment. And uh, this has a great deal to do, you know, you can have someone, if you cannot discern spiritually, you can have someone come into your church and they can all but destroy it if you're not careful. Smiling, good buddy, buddy. But I mean wicked, wicked, wicked. And they may not even be aware of it. But as the chief shepherd, you've got to keep the peepers open. And you've got to discern. Because it does happen, but that, that's okay. Father knows and gives the knowledge to be able to take care of it. Brenda from North Carolina. Have you ever heard of other chapel students having problems with not being welcome in different churches? What do we do when we feel unwelcome? Well, Christ said you walk outside that door, kick the dust off your feet, and keep moving. If... if um, if you are behaving yourself well, don't ever go into a church that is ignorant and start preaching to them on a level that there is no way they could possibly understand. That's like going to somebody's house and, and they pass some peanut butter and crackers around and you say, oh, I just hate peanut butters and crackers and stomp it in the rug. You know, you, you, don't, you don't do that. Okay. You... you um, you practice pulpit decorum. Don't go into somebody else's house and mess up. Okay. Now, it's all right to go there and plant seeds because we are seed planters. If they grow, fine. If they don't, no problem. But I, I never want to be anywhere where I'm not wanted. It's just real easy to, to um, haul at. Okay. I said haul out. Get gone. Okay. Jimmy from California. I also have one more question for you, sir. I worry a lot sometimes about everything like my Christian walk and if I'm forgiven. I pray and give all my worries and cares to the Lord, but it comes back at times. See your story to me. You, you, you don't expect me to believe that, do you, um, Jimmy? If you truly give it to the Lord, you would be stupid if you took it back. Do you know why? I want you to read. I want you to read the last 15 verses of Jeremiah chapter 23. You ask, well, what, what burden has the Lord got for me today? And he will dump the whole load on you and then some. Okay. Don't you doubt God. If he forgives you, one of the worst sins you can do to yourself is to pick it up and bring it back into your little worry department again. Okay. To worry is to doubt every promise of God. Now, I'm not scolding you, but I'm helping you. That's called tough love. Okay. And being an old Marine, um, 
I, I, sometimes we're a little bit that way because we don't like to see people suffer. We like for them to get it right. So don't pick it back up again after God forgives you. It, it irritates him. Guess what you're going to get? Eric from Florida. You said the unpardonable sin is not allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through you when you are delivered up to the Antichrist. Nowhere in the Bible does it say this ever. Boy, well, I've got some doozies today. This, uh, Eric, you, you don't read the Bible, do you? You're not much of a Bible student. You've certainly never read um, uh, Luke chapter uh, 10. You've never, you've never read um, the Luke 12, verses 10 through about 13. Uh, because that's where it says it, okay? And it says it real good. It makes it very obvious. And that's what it is. Only God's elect can commit that sin, okay? And Gerald from Tennessee. In Second Timothy, where it says must be of one wife, does that mean one wife at a time or one wife for life? It's according to how the law, if you were married and were separated, Sometimes the law annuls it, and uh, it's gone. It didn't happen. And if you repent totally, Christ erases it, if, if you're the, of the right heart and mind. And I am out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. It's His letter to you. And when you read that letter, it makes His day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If and only if we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Now, one thing that's most important, though, and you listen to me good now, you stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.